Welcome back to the channel, everybody. And today it's yet another video on my 2024 offseason prediction series. It's the New York Giants, my favorite team, the New York Giants. What a rough year it was, but make sure to hit the like and uh, leave a comment in the comment section below. Both those things help with the algorithms and push that channel out. And to subscribe if you haven't already. I got a bunch of other videos in this series and a bunch of mock drafts coming up, a deep dive series soon to come. But we're going to focus on the Giants and their offseason predictions. And as a fan of the team, this one was somehow more difficult almost because I think you're a little bit more critical of your own team while also maybe a little bit too high on certain aspects of your team. And I tried to find a nice little balance in there. You know, what's going to happen with Saquon Barkley? I think that's the biggest question that they have. I feel like, you know, with the flux that happened with the coaching staff and Wink Martindale, now you're pretty much guaranteed you're going to bring Xavier McKinney back. You had some bright spots. Kayvon Thibodeau absolutely came on, really established himself as one of the better young uh, linebackers, edge rushers, whatever you want to call them, uh, in the league. And you hope for him to take another step forward in this upcoming uh, season, even with a new defensive coordinator. Who's that going to be? Can Dable keep the locker room together? Uh, that's a big question mark, you know, because apparently he did lose the locker room there for a bit. And the frustration of the season, I could understand. Lots of key injuries. Andrew Thomas injured through most of the first half of the season. Daniel Jones out most of the year in general. Not really having a lot of wide receiver depth. Darren Waller not staying healthy. Saquon Barkley being, you know, not exactly at 100% and seemingly having lost a step. That's another aspect of will they bring him back? Will they not bring him back? He just didn't have that oomph, I, for the lack of a better term, I don't really know what else to put it, that he had in that rookie season and even going into the second year of his career, he just doesn't, he just didn't have it. The breakaway speed really isn't there that, you know, there were so many times you saw him and he just, he's one on one with the safety and it's like any other version of Saquon Barkley beats that safety and he was just kind of just falling into the guy. So there's a lot of concerns in that aspect of wanting to dedicate so much of your cap space, but I figured out a way to open up a lot of cap space uh, in order to make some pretty big signings There's some really good free agents out there that are particular to the needs that the Giants are going to have and also they are in a great position draft wise two second round picks uh, finessed Seattle out of their second round pick for Leonard Williams that was a really good trade uh, in hindsight so they're picking really high and they got a lot of great players at the disposal but we got to start the obvious that's the coach so, of course, the the uh, head coach of the New York Giants is Brian Dable. Uh, he won Coach of the Year just last year for bringing this team really out of the gutter, really overachieved. Uh, there has been a thing about perhaps he kind of lost the locker room. He certainly clashed with Wink Martindale. Now, Martindale does have a history of clashing with head coaches, so it's hard to say whether or not this is all on Dable. Who's the one saying negative things about Dable? Are they like Martindale loyalists, all that? It's just a real shame that didn't work out because that was a really good coaching staff uh, that they had uh, that now they're going to be looking to replace the defensive coordinator. Uh, they kept Mike Kafka, which, I mean, for one more year, he is getting head coaching uh, interviews, so maybe there is something to that. You know, it was just a bad year. You look at some of the offensive stats here. It was just a bad year altogether. Um you know, not a lot of stability at the quarterback position, injuries on the offensive line, especially early in the year, uh, just poor offensive line coaching. You know, the wide receiver room uh, was inexperienced and lacked depth, so it didn't. nothing really came through until much later in the year when Wandale Robinson really started to come along. Uh, Jalen Hyatt started to perform a little bit better. So you want to see what this team is going to look like because just two years ago when they had a healthy uh, Daniel Jones, they were a playoff team. And they were beating good teams. They were beating the Titans. They were beating Green Bay. Beating Baltimore. You know, they were still a step below uh, the Eagles and Cowboys, which they kind of came into this year the same. But they had, when that team was healthy, they were competitive with a lot of the teams, if not capable of beating them. So it was kind of a given up year on offense. You know, 30th in points. 26th in pass attempts, second to last in passing yards, dead last in sacks allowed. They allowed so many sacks. They couldn't convert in the red zone. They couldn't convert on third down. And a lot of that had to do with just, you know, they, I mean, the offensive line was so bad. And they brought in the Raiders, uh, I think it was uh, Crisillo. Crisillo is his name. He did a great job 
uh, with that Raiders offensive line. You know, Jermaine Illuminor and Greg Van Roten had like career years uh, as offensive linemen. Uh, Van Roten is like 12 years into his career almost, I think. Uh, and he finally broke out. He's going to be a free agent. We'll see what that looks like. Andre James had a pretty good year as well. So they're bringing, they're giving much more uh, upside talent to Crisillo to work with. And you got one of the best left tackles in the league who you can hope can stay healthy. He wasn't healthy at all through the first half of the season. Uh, and, you know, you got to ride Daniel Jones, I think, at this point. I could see them maybe trying to trade up from six to one. Or six to three, if they really, if they really want to get Gene Daniels or something. But personally, I just, you know, you didn't really get a chance to see what this team was going to look like uh, from the off season that you just built. So I think you got to give that opportunity. And the, whoever the defensive coordinator is going to become is inheriting a team that, on paper, didn't really look all that great. They were tied for first in turnovers forced. They were top 10 and third down. You know, they brought a lot of pressure. They didn't allow a lot of passing touchdowns. A lot of what they gave up was on the ground. But that was also because teams were shortening games. And, you know, they were outside of Dexter Lawrence. And then, you know, Ashawn Robinson kind of came into play there a bit. Uh, Bobby Okariki had a great year. Uh, but a lot of these numbers aren't necessarily reflective of how well they played. I think the sack number is concerning. Uh, and the red zone percentage, I think, is concerning because that's sort of that has really nothing to do with the offense playing poorly. Uh, that can really affect all these other things like touchdowns allowed. It's, you know, you're working with short fields, but they were great out there down. Once the team got in the red zone, they couldn't really make a stop, and that's because they couldn't get the pressure. So Kevon Thibodeau and Dexter Lawrence were really the only bright spots in terms of that. So they're going to be having to look for another edge rusher to complement Kevon Thibodeau as he's Ojolari just you know is too on and off with his injuries. His contract is coming up also. So they got to find a replacement there. It'll be interesting to see who the defensive coordinator is that's going to be able to take some of the talent that they have uh, and try to replicate what Martindale had done so well for two years and have it also reflect uh, statistically as well with hopes that the offense is also improved. And they're starting the season with $22 million in salary cap. Now, there is a lot of mobility for them, as I'm going to show you, in order to clear up some cap space and to bring back some of the bigger uh, bigger names in this. And one name that isn't coming back is going to be Saquon Barkley. That doesn't seem to really be in the cards. Uh, sort of let him go, replace him with some other type of running game strategy. But you're able to cut Darius Slayton and Mark Lewinsky. Uh, not a lot of dead money in there. And you're getting almost $12 million in salary cap just from that. I'm also going to restructure Andrew Thomas and get almost $15 million in cap savings and Dexter Lawrence to get 11 and a half. So I'm clearing up a lot of extra cap space to then make a couple of interesting signings here that I think they really need on the defensive side of the football. We'll start with Ashawn Robinson. I'm going to give him three years, $10 million, $1 million bonus. Uh, you know, you can even throw a void year in there. I think he did really well in that complimentary role to Dexter Lawrence. And I, I think especially in the run game that allows you to take Lawrence off the field, uh, you know, to catch his breath, get his legs back underneath him, get some rest because Aishon's such a good space eater in that sense. And he can do a little bit of getting after the passer as well, but you really like him in that nose tackle role, uh, like a pure nose tackle role on early downs. Uh, Xavier McKinney had a great year. He played every snap. I'm going to give him the four-year, $40 million contract with $20 million signing bonus, throw a void year on there to spread out that bonus. Uh, so a total of $60 million. Uh, that's like the Marcus Williams contract I believe I used. Uh, to mimic that, Marcus Williams got got five years, seventy five million. Uh, so I'm doing four years, sixty million here. So it's the same amount per year. Throw the void year in there to spread it out. Not and uh, of course backload the steal. Uh, Isaiah Simmons is another one. They traded a seventh round pick for him, and I like how he you know he had some moments in there, and I think you can keep him for relatively cheap. A two year, eight million with a two million dollar bonus and a void year. So you're spreading out that bonus. You know you're not quite hitting that $5 million per year uh, cap hit. And then Jihad Ward, who's really like a – he's a locker room guy. He's you know high energy out there on the field, high effort guy, good situational edge guy who can play, uh, kick him inside if you need him to. 
Uh, and you can get him again relatively cheap. He a one year one point two million dollar contract, hundred thousand dollar bonus. That's basically the contract he was just playing on. Didn't really blow anyone away, but I think Giants fans would understand wanting to keep Jihad Ward and him being an integral part of uh, that locker room in particular. So with all those moves, despite re-signing all those guys, I was able to get $50.1 million in spending cap, uh, which is an amazing number to have. Uh, you know, you want to keep those keep those uh, re-signings on the low end, uh, of course, uh, to make sure you have this money because you are going to want to make some moves in free agency because uh, you do have some pretty important needs, uh, which include the running back position. You don't really need to be paying, though. You're not Your roster is not in a position to be paying double digit numbers to a running back um unless it's sort of like a last minute thing to bring back saquon but you need a wide receiver i think you need like an alpha wide receiver i think you can get one in the draft whether malik neighbors or marvin harrison jr and i think you can still go out and get a free agent wide receiver as well i think you're also looking at the offensive line particularly on the interior maybe get a third uh tackle uh, in case evan neal has to get kicked into guard full time you want an edge opposite cave on Thibodeau because, like we talked about, uh, with the sack numbers, uh, they just weren't there. And then you also want corners um, to improve that cornerback room. You have Deontay Banks. You're losing a Dory Jackson, uh, so you want to get better cornerback play. I would say uh, to help out that pass rush, to help out that front four, get to the quarterback. So then, when you have some of these uh, struggles, you can uh, make up for it with good coverage on the back end. So I am very much going to be using this $50 million in cap space. And we're going to start with Greg Van Roten. He's an interior offensive lineman. We talked about him a little bit earlier, talking about the offensive line coach from the Raiders. Uh, he had a career year, so he can come in and hopefully fit right into what you were hoping Mark Lewinsky was going to be. And you can get him at a relatively cheap contract because he's so late in his career. I think he's like 33, 34 years old. So a two-year, $12 million, $1.5 million bonus. You're not really breaking the bank. You're basically paying him the same amount you would have paid uh, Mark Lewinsky so you're just re reallocating that cap hit to somebody else then I'm looking at uh, wide receiver Gabe Davis from the Buffalo Bills reuniting with Dable I'm giving him that Michael Gallup contract uh, that's what I based it off of five years 33 million with a 20 million dollar bonus uh, you know it's he comes in he's a I think he's a solid every every situation wide receiver unlike uh, Jalen Hyatt or even like a Wandale Robinson, who's sort of like your gadget slot guy, you can and you can still be in a position to t use your first uh, round pick on a wide receiver to get in and be a true wide receiver one out there for you. Uh, and then Gabe Davis and Jalen Hyatt can sort of fit in there on the outside with Wandale uh, in the slot, like I said. And then there's cornerback Legarius Sneed, and I gave him that Trayvon Diggs contract. Uh, he's somebody I think is going to make a lot of money. Uh, it's a five-year, $75 million, $22 million bonus. It's a lot of money, and he's going to help out uh, that cornerback room. He's an upgrade for me over Dory Jackson for sure uh, in terms of age and I think ability. And I think having him and Deontay Banks, and Deontay Banks had a quietly pretty good year uh, as a rookie corner, one of the hardest positions to play as a rookie just because the overall team was so bad. I don't think he really got the shine that he probably deserved. Uh, but having him and Snead, I think, is your two outside corners. With then, you know, you got Cordell Flott, Aaron Robinson coming back maybe. Uh, you got a number of guys who can come in and fill that other spot uh, on the inside. Uh, but you really, this is a free agency period where you can set yourself up to make some uh, real difference-making signings uh, like like a Snead and Gabe Davis. So even then, we're left with $23.5 million in salary cap to run. So you could theoretically, if you can work out some sort of a deal with Saquon Barkley that you're comfortable with, bring him back as well. I think that you have opened yourself up to that possibility, but you've also put yourself in a position where you can sign maybe like that second tier free agent running back uh, that might just better suit the offensive system. Maybe the way Dable likes it for not a big high price. You know, I think Barkley is one of those running backs that fits really any system, but he really had lost a step. So I'm not, it, it just, I like having this extra cap space gives you some maneuverability in that second and third wave of free agency uh, and not necessarily blowing half of that on your running back who historically hasn't been able to stay all that healthy lately. So this is my draft strategy for the Giants. It's Malik neighbors at six, unless 
Marvin Harrison Jr. drops. Uh, <laughs> I put LOL because what are the chances of that? Uh, in the event that both of them are gone, I, I'm looking to trade back, like I said uh, before. Um, day two, we're looking at the pass defense. You know, they got two second round picks and a third round pick, so they get three picks can be made there. Uh, I'm looking at the pass defense in that if you don't get Legereus Sneed, then I'm looking at cornerback. Uh, and if you do get Legereus Sneed, I'm looking at that edge room. I'm looking at Chris Braswell, for example. Uh, even with you getting Greg Van Roten, I'm also going to be looking at grabbing an interior offensive lineman as well. Uh, someone that can play the other guard spot, because I still think even with signing a Greg Van Roten, you still need the other guard position filled. Uh, and then even if you are getting a edge or a corner there in the second round, I'm also going to be looking for whatever one is left over probably. Also on day two, you know, whether it's a guy who can, you know, another guy that can play on the outside as a corner. You can't have enough of those in the NFL. Um, or if I've already sort of filled that out, I'm also looking at the running back uh, group. I'm looking at Blake Corum. I'm looking at Trey Benson, uh, Braylon Allen, guys like that. Uh, and then on day three, I'm gra- if I haven't grabbed the running back yet, I'm grabbing the running back uh, in that fourth round. And then I'm really spending a lot of day three just getting the best players that you can uh, at the at positions of value. Uh, I think you having that type of a that type of depth on the roster, especially because they have had all these injuries and they got guys who, you know, you you cringe at the thought of if they get hurt, then you got nothing. You saw what happened with that offense. The offense couldn't move the ball without Andrew Thomas, and then when they get Andrew Thomas back, Daniel Jones is gone. So there was you you had this absolutely brutal scenario where the depth really worked against you. So making sure you got depth out there, you know, and also helping out with special teams in general. You got a new special teams guy out there as well. I think there's a lot of potential here, especially on that day three for the Giants to make some important uh, decisions. And there you have it. My offseason predictions for the New York Giants, my New York Giants. Make sure to leave in the comment section below what you think. And of course, thumbs up the video helps out with the algorithms and subscribe if you haven't already. I got other videos from this series on one side of my head and I got a recommended video by the YouTube overlords themselves about something that you personally would like that I've made. So let's see how much YouTube actually might know you by clicking that video and then watching that one and then doing the next one and the next one, the next one and the next one and just marathon my videos all day long. How about that? Enjoy your good weekend. It's Pro Bowl week. So this is like kind of the crappy week for football. Super Bowl is coming up. See you guys.